So I have the wonderful privilege of being joined today by David Ansara. David is the chief executive of the Free Market Foundation. Uh, David, it's wonderful to have you uh, join me today. Thank you so much for making the time. I know you had some other commitments, but yeah, I appreciate you uh, making the time to chat today. Well, I've always got time for you, Pila. It's an absolute pleasure being on your show. Finally, um, it's been it's been long enough. Uh, I must say, hey, um, when I heard the news that you were moving to the Free Market Foundation, uh, it was bittersweet at the point, um, and I believe it was for you as well. Uh, sweet because you're obviously moving on to a new and I would think more uh, influential role, uh, but bitter because the Solutions with David Ansara podcast, of which I was and still am a huge admirer, uh, I believe would be put on hold. But I know you said that the podcast would continue, just not with you as the host. But yeah, it, it was bittersweet for that reason was it as bittersweet for you or did you feel uh, emotions either way yeah look i am relishing this new opportunity here at the free market foundation there's a lot of work to be done and i think it's very important that we actively promote free markets in south africa at the moment we have a very uh, statist makeup to our economy which i'm sure we'll discuss later but yeah the institute of race relations where i spent four and a half years uh, heading up the center for risk analysis was an incredibly uh, impactful role as well. And I'm very grateful to my erstwhile colleagues there at the Institute and very glad to see uh, people such as yourself also appearing on their platforms. But yeah, the IRR continues to do great work. There's a lot of depth there. Um, and But I wanted to put my skills to the test in a new environment and I could not resist the call to come and lead the Free Market Foundation. I must also just say that I'm incredibly privileged to have joined the uh, Institute of Race Relations as well. Uh, but that's obviously a subject for another day. It's about you today. And you touched on what I think is a very important and what will be the pivotal point of our discussion today, which is that you took up the mantra, if you will, to join the uh, Free Market Foundation to, as it were, spread free market ideas. W what exactly does free market mean? I mean, obviously, you and I are like-minded individuals. I've joined the Institute of Race Relations for that exact reason. But for somebody who might be listening and thinking, well, what, what exactly do they mean? I mean, I know when I chat to some of my friends, for example, they understand the market bit. They understand why I think a market-based society is the exact kind of society that creates the kind of prosperity that we've seen over the past 200 years. Certainly, Steven Pinker mm. in his book, um, uh, Enlightenment Now, documents it quite well. But what they have a challenge with, and I think rightly so, is the free in the term free market. So what exactly does the free in free market mean? And what exactly does the uh, free market foundation seek to do to advance these ideas that we speak about quite theoretically? Yeah, well, when we talk about free markets, essentially what we're talking about is free people. So uh, many people look at economic activity or the discipline of economics and they think this is this very highly technical thing. Uh, but ultimately what we're talking about when we speak about economic affairs is the free voluntary exchange of goods and services between individuals. And that's not just important for making money. It's also important for your sense of self, your purpose in the world, that you are free to improve your own personal circumstances, that there are opportunities available to you uh, to Im improve yourself and the fortunes of your family. Uh, so really what we're talking about when we talk about free markets is actually a bundle of goods. Um, so it's very much around personal agency and individual liberty. So respecting the rights of individuals uh, to determine their own idea of the good life or to pursue uh, various economic activities. Um, we're also talking about freedom to trade. Uh, so we don't want there to be any artificial impediments between people standing in their way. Um, and we also recognize that there must be a system of laws uh, that uh, essentially moderate the behavior of, of, of individuals operating in a society, that where there are conflicts between people, that those can be resolved peacefully and amicably through a system of, of neutral laws. So really in terms of uh, the, the kind of core objectives of the Free Market Foundation is to promote uh, free trade and the, the voluntary exchange of goods and services. Uh, it's, and that leads unambiguously uh, to economic growth and prosperity, as you and also Stephen Pinker have elucidated. Uh, then there's that protection of property rights. Uh, those property rights are the building blocks of, of economic activity that gives everybody who owns property skin in the game that gives them uh, something that they can call their own um, and that is legally enforceable against 
anybody who might try to seize their property away from them, whether that's another individual or a government. And uh, yeah, finally, we have the rule of law, which is uh, that system of laws that are fairly and equitably uh, applied to all individuals in society, regardless of their social status or their race or their ethnicity or their religion. Uh, everybody is subject to the same laws of the land. So that's essentially the principles that we try to espouse in our work. We do a lot of advocacy. So we write uh, numerous op-eds in the media. If you open any uh, newspaper today, you'll probably see an FMF uh, opinion piece there. Um, and then we also do submissions to parliament. Uh, we do longer form reports and also media appearances like this one. So we're really trying to spread the gospel that free markets is not just something for capitalists or the wealthy. It's something that really empowers everyone, including and especially the poor. And as you know, Pilar, we have a very big problem with poverty and unemployment in South Africa. And so uh, we really need to come up with some alternative policy solutions to the ones that we currently have. I mean, I always wonder when I think about this, what is the issue here? Is it the issue that people aren't really hearing the good news, as you've, I think, quite rightly put it? Or are they hearing it, but just rejecting it? Well, I think that most people would actually have a fairly high degree of sympathy towards our ideas. Uh, you know, if you kind of break it down, you know, if you had to say to someone, uh, do you want to be a property owner and do you want to be able to legally enforce the rights over your property? Most people would say yes. And some of the polling that the IRR has done has, has indicated that most people uh, want to uh, be free from, uh, you know, state overreach. They, they don't want a bully telling them what to do or or, or dictating uh, how they should live their lives. Uh, they want, if there's some kind of crime that's committed against them, uh, they want to be able to have some kind of recourse to the courts to, to be able to, to enforce those rights. Uh, so, you know, we, we think that we're on the side of the silent majority in South Africa. Uh, and many of those people, unfortunately, their voice has been silenced and the voices of our ideological opponents have for a very long time dominated the political discourse in South Africa. So uh, the African National Congress, which has been in power for almost three decades now, uh, is guided by the philosophy of the National Democratic Revolution. It's an avowedly socialist and African nationalist organization. Uh, so it's, it's, its prism, its lens is uh, one of class struggle and racial uh, nationalism, uh, which I think has been very destructive for South Africa. But, you know, I think that the ANC and some of its ideological proponents have been very good at normalizing many of their philosophical principles in our political discourse. So, uh, you know, ideas like transformation, just kind of taken as given that this is somehow a good, but actually if you unpack that, what it, what it leads to is um, abuse of state resources. It leads to interference with the activity of firms and, and individuals. Uh, it distorts uh, market signals or price signals. So a lot of the problems that we're now seeing at ESCOM are the consequence of a very aggressive race-based preferential procurement policy. So that is just one area in which uh, many of the ideological uh, roots or, or, or underlying uh, concepts that the ANC puts forward have actually ended up eroding some of our critical institutions in South Africa and led to this suppression of, of, of growth and, and personal incomes. Yeah, no, absolutely. I resonate with that uh, a great deal. Uh, and I know a lot of my friends uh, at Sakalicha as well say the same thing. I had a discussion mm. with Tian not so long ago, and he was essentially saying the same thing. But I mean, it wouldn't be, I think, a fruitful conversation if we didn't have uh, a tussle, as it were, because I, I don't really want to make this podcast an eco chamber for people who espouse mm. like-minded ideas. So I think let's go back to some of the things that you have spoken about. So you have noted spoken about spoken about artificial impediments to growth and i believe you mean by that regulation which we can touch touch upon and then you said i think very importantly that the issue is an ideological one you mentioned ad nauseum in your speaking segment just before this one um, mm. that the anc and its ideological proponents will obviously reject the kind of ideas that you and i espouse uh, over here and my curiosity is why that might be the case um, and are we ourselves to blame or should we look at this ideological lens as a double-edged sword because you know can we not ourselves be accused of being ideological and you know this really uh, hit home for me when i was thinking about the following question that i'm going to pose to you right now which is when you think about what has gone wrong with south africa and the abyss in which we have found ourselves in 
what is it that's gone wrong? If you were to ask two people from opposing sides of the left-right political divide, you will get two very different but predictable answers. And that, I think, points quite strongly to uh, Carl Jung's uh, people don't have ideas, ideas have people uh, observation. Mm. But can we not be accused of being just as ideological ourselves and being unable to see the broader zeitgeist, as it were, for what it actually is? Well, look, you and I are engaged in the battle of ideas. So we have to have confidence in the ideas that we put forward. It doesn't mean that we must be dogmatists or that we're always going to be right. Uh, but we have a, a certain worldview, certain uh, way in which we approach uh, policy problems. And, you know, I think one of the big mistakes that many people often make is a kind of assumption that politics is really a, a kind of technical exercise, that uh, all you need is the people with the right skills and the right positions, uh, and then, you know, policy will, will kind of sort itself out. Um, so, you know, even uh, Rob Herzog, the, the famous uh, South African business businessman who's a uh, billionaire, quite forthright, uh, quite scathing in his criticism. You know, during the Biz News conference, he said, well, you know, we what we need, what would be my dream cabinet would be to have, uh, you know, a former sportsman in the sports ministry and a doctor in the health ministry and uh, a banker in the national treasury. And then uh, that technocratic approach will, will solve all the problems. But ideology matters because policy is downstream from ideology. So policy doesn't exist in a vacuum. It is informed by the ideas. And, you know, those ideas uh, have real world consequences. So we have over the last uh, one and a half centuries since Karl Marx was writing, you know, witnessed the implementation of uh, many of uh, the systems that he put forward. Uh, so this idea of democratic centralism, which was kind of honed by uh, Vladimir Lenin in Russia after the October 1917 revolution. You know, that led to a elimination of political opponents, collectivization of agriculture, which led to the starvation of millions of people. Uh, many millions more were uh, herded into gulags uh, where they died quietly outside of the view of, of the public. Uh, you know, artists, intellectuals were hounded into exile or themselves put in, in some of these camps. If you look at Mao's China, uh, again, collectivization of agriculture, great leap forward, this big attempt by the state to industrialize China actually took living standards in China backwards. You had uh, people, uh, farmers, peasant farmers, melting their pots and pans and homemade uh, furnaces to try and meet steel production targets that were set by the state, uh, people being punished for growing their own grain. Uh, but ultimately, market forces, it's not just a, a, a preference, a, a policy choice. It is actually a reflection of how people behave. So in China, many people started out of desperation to feed their families, uh, to engage in private voluntary exchange uh, uh, around agricultural goods, uh, desperate to hide themselves away from, from the state, because if they were discovered, they would have been executed for defying the state. Um, and, um, you know, Deng Xiaoping, who came into power after, Mao, after Chairman Mao passed away, he recognized this, that the, the system was changing and that market forces were essentially irresistible. There's a perception that Deng, that he uh, saw the light and that he, he decided to liberalize China's economy. No, the pressure was actually coming from the bottom up. Uh, again, we saw in the former Soviet Union, uh, the satellite states that Imperial Russia had uh, controlled for so long, there was this spontaneous uprising of, of uh, disobedience against that system uh, when the Soviet Union started to to unravel, and you know many of those countries, for example, the Baltic states, some of the Eastern European states, are now extremely uh, prosperous and successful uh, after the fall of the of the Soviet Union. So you know I think that there are some historical precedents there, and we also have our own precedents in South Africa now, 30 years uh, under ANC rule, and I think the, the jury is no longer out. I think. Uh, African nationalist and socialist policies have been a disaster for South Africa. And if we look at other countries in Africa where those policies have been implemented, most notably in Zimbabwe, uh, where uh, poverty and immiseration resulted from interference in the central bank and the monetary uh, system there, and uh, the violent uh, dispossession of many farms that destroyed agriculture, you know, I think those are some pretty important cautionary tales that we need to take seriously and that we definitely want to avoid seeing in South Africa. So I'm very keen to have 
uh, a robust intellectual debate uh, with people. Uh, but, you know, I'm also confident that the evidence is on our side and uh, history does not uh, reflect well on some of these socialist experiments. So, you know, I think we also need to recognize human nature, human behavior, uh, that individuals are different. They have different objectives. And when you concentrate political power in the hands of an elite, uh, whether that's the ANC or Vladimir Putin or Nicolas Maduro in uh, Vietnam, you know, the tendency is the same. There's a tendency to, uh, to hold on to power, to defend it at all costs. And so we need to also act as a check on government excesses and government overreach. That's why civil society organizations like the FMF, like the IRR are so important. But again, I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of somebody who might come from an entirely different position, because it seems to me that we're all speaking across purposes. And there's a wonderful book by Thomas Sowell. I believe it's called um, not Knowledge and Decisions, uh, Conflict and Visions, uh, in which he postulates that there are two opposing visions. There's the unconstrained vision and then there's the constrained vision. You speak about human nature, which I think is awfully important for a conversation such as this. So Sol argues that um, the unconstrained vision sees itself unconstrained by the fallibility of mankind. Um, and so what that invariably translates into are some of these ideas, such as the kind that you have espoused, um, that were chaired by people such as Karl Marx, uh, Chairman Mao, etc. And then he postulates a second idea and says that there is the constrained vision, which sees itself constrained by mankind and the fallibility uh, of, of mankind. Um, and as a result of that, we, we, we need to try and build systems from the bottom up, which I think you quite rightly speak of. But the reason I ask this and the reason I hammer home on this quite uh, extensively is because, as I said earlier, if you talk to two people from you know, two opposing sides of the left-right political divide, um, and you ask them what has gone wrong with South Africa, you will hear from the more left-leaning person that it's capitalist forces that have infiltrated the government, that have captured the state, and that have, as a result, created a minority of very rich, or as Pierre Polyev, uh, the Canadian politician, says, that you have a few have yachts and many have nots. So that's what the more left-leaning uh, person would say. But a more right-leaning individual, certainly right of the center, would say, is that the issue is the state. The issue is a collapsing state, uh, an imploding state, which you know happens quite naturally when you have a state that brings uh, everything closer to itself. And, and that certainly to me seems to be where the issue is. You know, we're arguing from two fundamentally different positions and how are we to ever reconcile those, pardon me, if we are to find a solution to the havoc that has been wreaked? Well, look, uh, medical personnel on the battlefield when there's a war raging, they apply a principle of triage. Uh, do you know what triage is, Peter? No, I have no idea what that is. So uh, there are three categories of patients that you have to deal with. So there are those soldiers on the battlefield who are uh, so mortally wounded that no matter what you do, you won't be able to, to save them. So you can try to um, uh, you know, stitch them up and uh, bandage their wounds, but ultimately they will, they will perish, they'll succumb. Then there are those uh, who are very lightly wounded and uh, if you do not give them medical treatment, uh, they will maybe be a bit uncomfortable and uh, not very happy, but they will ultimately survive without medical attention. Then there's that group in the middle, which if you do not give them medical attention, they will perish. So your intervention there is the difference between life and death. And I think it's analogous to the battle of ideas that we're waging at the moment. So there are some people on the far left of the spectrum who are died in the world communists. Uh, they have their set of beliefs and they, have, uh, they are guided by this idea of materialist view of history, the perfectibility of man, um, that uh, institutions can be crafted in such a way that uh, results in pure equality, even though uh, history tells us that that actually often leads to gross inequalities, even, even higher inequalities in a capitalist system. Um, and so those are, in a sense, the, the mortally wounded who we cannot save. Uh, then there are our own people, uh, the people who agree with us, and uh, we should definitely keep engaging with them. Uh, you know, uh, John Ken Berman, who used to, uh, used to be the CEO of the Institute of Race Relations for 30 years, uh, he said that there's nothing wrong with preaching to the choir, because uh, to preaching to the converted, because they're not as converted as you often think they are. But put that aside for one moment. So there is that group in the middle who are open to being persuaded. And I think those people are people who are concerned with the future of South Africa. 
They want what's best for their families. They probably don't go home at night and read Thomas Sowell and Friedrich Hayek and, uh, you know, would describe themselves as died in the world classical liberals, but they have an interest in preserving their incomes, uh, being able to improve the circumstances of their children, to be able to educate their children, uh, to be able to have access to healthcare, uh, the, the basic conditions that make life uh, bearable and enjoyable. And unfortunately, uh, the current system and con configuration is not serving that. So, you know, that's where the majority of our energy and attention should be directed, is trying to convince the, the, that silent majority that I spoke of earlier. And, uh, yeah, you know, I think very important, um, you mentioned this term echo chamber, to get out of that echo chamber. And podcasts like this are a fantastic way of disseminating these ideas, but uh, direct interactions with others, uh, interactions with people who may be your opponents, I think you can uh, uh, disagree vigorously, but also in a, in a way that is civilized and respectful. Uh, but I'm not going to be too equivocal in promoting uh, the classical liberal ideas of the freedom of the individual, market economy, the rule of law and property rights, because these are the fundamental ingredients of, of, of a good life. And uh, I think they are worth promoting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and before we talk about how these ideas sort of uh, play themselves out in the mainstream or in reality, as it were, uh, I want to talk about some of the myths that I think are wild or are widely held by, I would say, people who are uh, opposed to the ideas that you and I espouse. Um, so what would you say to the person who says, uh, who claims to have read, as many people do, Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, when they actually have not, very few people have actually read that book, um, who claim after after having read that book, pardon me, um, that you know the free market is about selfishness and channeling one's selfishness and achieving one's desired ends mm -hmm. at all costs. Uh, so, so what would you say to that? Because I do see that as one myth that is crying out to be debunked, but I don't know why it's so difficult to do so. Well, look, I mean, I think um, individuals do tend to be self-interested. I don't, and as Adam Smith pointed out in the uh, theory of moral sentiments as well, which is the kind of less uh, acknowledged text. Um, you know, people are also motivated by other concerns, not just material concerns. I think that is another mistake that uh, Marxist theorists make as well, that they see uh, this kind of materialist, uh, 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 um, teleological uh, kind of view of history, that uh, there are these forces of history that are just marching onwards, and it's all about class conflict. Uh, Marx didn't really anticipate that there'd be this growth of the middle class of the bourgeoisie. So, um, you know, I think getting back to Adam Smith, you know, he also recognized that people are altruistic. They, they uh, man desires to be not only loved, but to be lovely. Um, so people are also motivated by status. So uh, your colleague, uh, Gabriel Krauser, often speaks about the esteem economy. And, uh, you know, that is something, a concept that Adam Smith uh, touched on in, in his own way. Um, you know, that, you know, uh, I think it was uh, Charlie Munger who said that people are not necessarily motivated by greed, but by envy. Um, so, you know, if somebody uh, in your uh, low income apartment block now suddenly is driving a better car, uh, that might not be as nice a car as the billionaire who's in the leafy suburbs. Uh, but you're more jealous of your of your immediate neighbor because of this uh, kind of imitative nature that, that, that many people have. So, you know, I think uh, Adam Smith is a lot more nuanced, um, you know, when he talks about the, the invisible hand of the market, ultimately what he's talking about is uh, if you combine all of the, the many hundreds, thousands, millions of decisions that individuals make on a day-to-day -day basis, that creates uh, certain outcomes and people have a way of, uh, of pursuing a, a path that that suits them maybe from the outside looking in it, it looks like they're not being entirely rational or something but often there is some hidden uh reason why uh, perhaps they might be less well off and often that's because there is a policy with a certain set of perverse incentives that has been imposed on them sometimes benevolently intentioned well-intentioned policies uh, but that actually create uh, perverse incentives uh, and and make people act in ways that actually lead to harmful consequences. So, you know, I think in the works of Adam Smith and, and in other classical liberal scholars, 
you know, what I think there is, is, is actually a kind of a caution, uh, a, um, a hesitancy to, to know exactly what's right for everyone. Uh, people are different. They have different pursuits. And, you know, so uh, not presupposing that you as an intelligent person, uh, you might have been very well trained and, and highly capable and qualified. Uh, but just because uh, you are in that position doesn't mean that you uh, necessarily know what is right for somebody else. Um, and, you know, we spoke about the Soviet Union earlier, and I think a very interesting example was that uh, they had very many uh, super intelligent people in the Soviet Union, chess champions and uh, mathematicians. And some of these mathematicians were then put into committees uh, to run various uh, aspects of the economy. So there were uh, actuaries, very sophisticated uh, models that they used to employ and one of these committees was responsible for uh, estimating what the annual production of shoes would be uh, for the year ahead. So every year the committee would gather and they would compare their models and statistics and they would say, okay, well, this year we're going to produce 11 million shoes. Because obviously there were no private shoe producers. Um, and lo and behold, the weather conditions would be slightly different. People's preferences would be, would be different. And they'd either produce uh, a massive surplus or there would be a shortfall so either there were too many shoes or there were too few shoes uh, but if you think of a market economy uh, if you go to any store you will see hundreds of different kinds of shoes uh, light shoes for running heavy shoes for workwear uh, thick shoes for winter conditions uh, sandals for summer conditions and you know no matter how enlightened you are as a central planner you can never predict how people's preferences will play out uh, in a complex uh, society. So, uh, you know, Friedrich Hayek said that, uh, you know, one of the, the, the fallacies that, that economists often make is that they think that they can control everything by design. Um, uh, and that, that's, that's just uh, uh, not the case. And I'm very glad that you touch upon uh, Adam Smith's The Theory of Moral Sentiments, because that has to be perhaps uh, probably my favorite book, uh, maybe second only to um, Dostoevsky's Notes from Underground. But I think oh, okay. both That's books book. uh, hammer home um, the, the the point that you're making. But I think so the, um, let's move. The quote that I want to share with you from Hayek, which I was struggling to remember, is the curious task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they really know about what they imagine they can design. Yeah, so I love that mind, quote. But, yeah. Um, so, you know, I think you know, you, you just kind of spoke about having a bit of humility, epistemic humility. And, you know, I think in many ways, this doctrine doesn't presuppose that you can understand everything in the world uh, with a neatly packaged theory. Um, you know, there is inherently uh, complexity to, to social systems. Um, and you might look at certain symptoms and you might say, okay, well, the problem is X, Y, Z, but, but often you might be mistaken or there might be some hidden reason uh, for that social phenomenon. So I think there is quite a lot of humility in the ideas that we put forward to that. Yeah, and I think it's just a matter of uh, getting them across um, and making sure that they're received as well as we uh, intend them to be received. But I think let's move to the tail end of our discussion, which is more about the reality of South Africa. So we've spoken uh, quite a bit about, you know, the theoretical underpinnings of, of some of the ideas that we espouse. And I think if people are more interested in, in, in the ideas themselves, they can, you know, look at some of the references that we have made. But I'm very interested in what you think has gone wrong with South Africa, practically speaking, we can talk about ESCOM, we can, we can use like very practical and tangible examples. And what do you think um, the a solution might be? Well, I mean, you mentioned ESCOM, and I think that that's very interesting because obviously there's a lot going wrong at ESCOM. Every week we read about a boiler that's exploded or a conveyor belt that is broken down or uh, some cable that has been stolen and what have you. So there are thousands of these technical problems in a complex system like ESCOM. But again, what was the original cause of those? So the, the boilers are exploding and the conveyor belts are breaking because the quality of the coal is, is of a low grade and there are rocks and debris in the, in the coal. Why is the coal like that? Well, because suppliers who are chosen under a preferential procurement policy are actually uh, purchasing the coal from somewhere else, then they are uh, replacing some of this coal with uh, rocks and debris and then uh, selling this very low quality product uh, into ESCOM. There's no quality controls. Uh, they have an insider who is uh, 
you know, looking the other way and allowing this to happen. And then they sell the excess coal uh, to buyers overseas. And so they make a, a kind of a double markup on, on this and a very handsome uh, profit at the expense of the taxpayer, you and I. So, you know, if you go downstream from that, uh, then the cause of that is politics, um, that we have uh, this policy of uh, transformationism or uh, black economic empowerment, uh, which is very, very much couched in moral terms. Uh, you know, it says, well, this is to uh, correct the injustices of the past. Uh, but, you know, what the actual effect is, is that it enriches a very small politically connected elite uh, that has benefited from its proximity to state resources. Uh, and whilst most South Africans, black and white, and now have to sit in darkness, they shut down their businesses and so on. Uh, because of, of this stitch up that's happening uh, at, at, at the political level. You know, so I think uh, that that is obviously uh, very frustrating for many people. And I would say to those people who might be feeling a, a sense of despair at this moment when you're sitting in stage six load shedding, well, the solution to political problems are political solutions. So you know, we need new political paradigm in South Africa. As I mentioned, this era of uh, African national socialism is kind of being discredited. It's, it's coming to an end. Uh, the question really is how quickly will it come to an end and what will replace it? I think we do have an opportunity here to have an opposition-led coalition, a multi-party coalition that could come and be the true custodians of the reform agenda. We've heard that, that word reform quite often over the last four to five years, but we've seen very little uh, substantive realization of those reforms. Uh, in, in actual fact, South Africa has gone backwards in the last five years. Um, you know, so this, uh, the great promise of reform was illusory. It was uh, smoke and mirrors, but there is this opportunity that opposition parties uh, can seize. That will mean that they're going to have to start now putting alternative policy proposals on the table uh, we're seeing uh, the Democratic Alliance marching to Lutuli House. Uh, some commentators have dismissed this as a political gimmick, uh, but, you know, that's what politics is all about, really. But, you know, I think that is that is correct of the DA to to point the blame uh, at its source, uh, Lutuli House, not even necessarily the union buildings. But if the DA comes to power in 2024 as part of a broader coalition, uh, that wouldn't have been their fault, the energy crisis, but it will be their problem. So they're going to have to come up with some very uh, practical, tangible solutions and move us away from the state-centric model. Uh, how you do that, I think, is going to be complicated and difficult, but not impossible. So uh, unbundling ESCOM, uh, separating the generation, transmission, uh, and distribution functions, I think, is a very important start. There's been a lot of uh, attempts to do that in the past, but we've been constrained by the politics. I think removing preferential procurement policy uh, from all state contracts, I think, uh, would help to uh, stop interfering with market signals. So that bidders to state contracts can now be judged in terms of the merits of the applications, the costs of the applications, rather than uh, the color of the directors of their businesses. So, you know, I think uh, it is beholden on the opposition, the potential coalition partners, not only to point out the, the current problems and to point the finger, but also to come with solutions. I think uh, what we're seeing in the city of Cape Town and the Western Cape, trying to open up uh, distribution to private bidders, to independent power producers, I think is a very good start. Uh, but we need much more of that. And we also need to think about the scale of our energy production needs. So for example, nuclear technology uh, for very valid reasons was dismissed uh, during the late Zuma years, because that was obviously a very strong corruption play. But that should be technology that we should be taking seriously. Do we have to mothball all of our coal-fired power plants, as uh, many in, in Davos and the, the World Economic Forum are advocating that we do? I think that that's a very bad idea. We sit on one of the world's largest deposits of coal. We need to get power urgently. It's all very well for those in Europe and America to, to judge us and criticize us but they're not sitting in 10 hours of darkness uh, in their homes every day. So we need a power solution that is 
as disconnected from politics as we can get it. We need to get the hands of politicians out of the energy sector. And that goes for very many other areas of the economy. Our trade policy needs a, a dramatic overhaul. We have too many tariffs and quotas and exemptions and just too much ministerial discretion in the hands of somebody like Ibrahim Patel. Again, his Department of Trade, Industry and Competition and that Competition Commission very aggressively imposes uh, BE requirements on all merger applications. So, you know, if you read the business day this morning, you'll see that uh, AB InBev is appealing to the state uh, to stop this merger between Distel and Heineken uh, because of the their control over the, the cider market. Uh, that's, I'm afraid, not going to cut it. Some of these businesses often appeal to the state for protection, but we actually need to stop that. We need to uh, start unraveling this corporatist compact that exists. And, you know, when you when you elevate the power of the state, you also increase the chances for state capture. State capture was not uh, just some aberration. It was a consequence of this growing, highly politicized state. And so when you increase the regulatory burden, you also incentivize some of these incumbent players to lobby and petition the state for special uh, exemptions or, or, or special treatment. And that actually creates uh, some of the kind of monopoly uh, systems that we have. So people on the left might say, oh, well, you know, look at all these, these big monopoly companies. They're just greedy and they are dominating these markets. We need a government authority to come break up these cartels. I would say, actually, no, we need to lower the power of the Competition Commission and allow more competitors to naturally come into the system. Um, so, yeah, I think that's maybe a flavor of some of the policy proposals that that we are going to be putting forward uh, at the FMF and uh, which we, which I myself am going to be writing about, as well as uh, my colleagues and 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 members of my team. But uh, yeah, you know, Pilar, I think uh, you know this is a critical juncture for South Africa. You know, we need some fresh ideas, some new thinking, and hopefully, political realignment can also provide an opportunity for us to really push those those policies through. Yeah, and that really uh, leaves me with a lot of confidence. Um, I spoke to Russell Lamberti not so long ago, and he said something that I thought was instrumental and really, really crucial. Um, and perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll just throw this to you, perhaps as a way to tail off our conversation. So the conversation that I had with him was, I think, predictably quite uh, pessimistic. And so I asked him if he could end the conversation on a lighter note or on a more positive note, pardon me. Uh, and he said, the positive note is what's built right into the uh, negative note. So he says that it's the fact that things are dysfunctional around us um, that should give us the confidence um, you know, to find the solutions from within. And he mm -hmm. says that the fact that um, people are starting to see that Big Brother's not looking after them means that individuals, families, clans, communities need to roll up their sleeves and take, and take hold of their future. You know, it, it's a very hard message. It's a, it's a maturing coming of age message. So I suppose the question that I want to throw to you is what can the individual do um, to incrementally improve their own well-being? Because I think it's these small incremental improvements that compound to a much larger uh, positive uh, outlook on the country. Yeah, look, we're the Free Market Foundation. So we are big proponents and uh, the supporters of freedom. But freedom also comes with corresponding responsibilities uh, towards others, right? So, and I think the, the big message, and I think Russell was probably touching on this in his discussion with you, was that, you know, no one's going to come to save you. The, the government is not necessarily your friend. That uh, is a collection of special interests with its own objectives, often competing uh, interests in, in, within the state as well. And, you know, we have to be the authors of our own destiny. We can't outsource the development of South Africa to government politicians. So, you know, even the opposition, they have their own flaws as well. Um, you know, there might be other teething pains and problems uh, with an opposition coalition as well. And, you know, given the state of the breakdown in many of our public institutions, uh, the, the effect that low economic growth has had on businesses and, and individuals, you know, there's a lot of hard work to do. Uh, no politician, no matter how capable or smart or hardworking, is going to fix these problems overnight. It's incumbent on you and me and everybody watching this show to take up the mantle and, uh, you know, to, to, to really 
own the future of this country. So many people are immigrating and I don't bemoan them for doing that. I don't, don't judge them for doing that. But this is a fantastic country. There is an abundance of wealth and potential opportunity here, but we need to get politicians out of the way before we can realize some of that potential. And that is really my, my big mission in my work. And I think the opportunity is there for the taking. And I think it's an optimistic message, actually. It's, you have to be realistic. Why, why have things gone so wrong? Don't want to sugarcoat anything. There's some definite people who are responsible for that and a set of ideas responsible for that. But these things aren't going to fix themselves. It's incumbent on you and me and everyone else to do that. And I think that that's a wonderful note to end today's conversation. David, thank you so much for uh, making the time. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, really enjoyed the conversation. And I'm sure the listeners and viewers are going to enjoy it just as much as I did. Um, but just before I let you go, uh, how can people get a hold of you? And yeah, or what is it that you're doing in the future that we can look forward to? Well, this work that we do is very important, but it does cost money. And if you feel that you resonate with the message that we have put forward today, I would really encourage you to open your wallet. Uh, even a very small nominal amount uh, will help us. If you go to freemarketfoundation.com, you'll see the banner for uh, the FMF's 1 million Rand challenge. So we have a very kind donor who's agreed to match all donations that are made to the FMF until the end of February by 50%. So if you donate 100 Rand to the FMF, uh, this uh, donor will agree to give us an additional 50 Rand. Uh, if you decide to give us 100,000 Rand, we'll get an, an additional 50,000 Rand. So we're aiming for that 1 million Rand mark. Uh, we're hoping to get there by the end of next month, but we need your support. And yeah, I'm afraid uh, that we need to buy some ammunition for this battle of ideas that we're waging. Uh, we have a lot of uh, very passionate supporters, but we need even more people to, to join us to fight the good fight. And David, Thank you. Thank you so much. And I wish you guys all the best. Um, yeah, looking forward to chatting to you again at some point. Yeah, thank you, Pilar. I really admire the work that you're doing. And I think uh, you're somebody with the right ideas and you're a man on a mission. And I, I'm really enjoying